All right, here we go, my friends. We're finally going to do this class, which I'm titling Uncertainty, or Uncertainty uh, and, and Probability Theory. The uncertainty comes from my book, uh, and also the probability theory comes from Jane's. This is a very heavy book, uh, thick, solid paper. You know you're really going to get something. No, what? Uh, we're also going to use uh, the works of David Stove and the Rationality of Induction. I'll flash that book up when we come to it. Now, how to best do this class, I haven't a clue. I thought about it a long time, and I figured out I have no idea. Uh, so I'm going to run these lectures. I'm going to run these videos. And it's, you know, I'm talking to a screen, and I don't do as good when I, I'm not talking to an audience. Because when I see the audience, I can see the mystification and the puzzlement in their faces. And I know when I'm saying something too fast, too slow, uh, or too complex, or I'm not making, uh, making sense, something like this, I don't have that ability to do that here. So we're going to have to rely on <laughs> me guessing what you like. You can leave comments to these videos wherever you see the video. And I'll look at those comments. I'll read them all. And I will answer the best ones in next week's blog. And in next week's video, not the best ones, the ones I think are the most compelling or something like this. I don't know how else to do it. Uh, I mean, you can also email me comments, that kind of a thing. I simply won't have time to answer every comment individually if there turn out to be a lot of them. If there's only one or two, then it's no problem. As far as uh, signing up goes to the class, that kind of thing, uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, there's going to be some homeworks. I'm going to give you one at the end of this particular lecture. And you have your go at it, see how you do, and then I'll answer it in the next uh, video. Or, unless it's so easy, I don't think it's worth answering. I think that's the case today. We'll see. And we'll go from there. Uh, whether, whether or not there'll be projects and so forth, uh, we'll just have to figure out. Whether there can be a sign-up. Uh, maybe I can make a sign-up database or something like this. Just for your own sake to make sure you stay on track. Well, we'll see. All right. So we're going to start trivially. This, this is uh, uncertainty. If there's uncertainty, well, we must also have certainty, in which there is. And that involves matters of truth and all that. And we're not going to get into that today. We will get into it. Uh, we're going to let all that kind of stuff float today. Today is kind of like a teaser course. We're going to start with something very simple, even trivial, uh, logic. And because most people think that logic is the epitome of rational thought, but it's not true. It's not so. Logic is not the epitome. In fact, logic, and I'm going to give you some teasers to this today, logic is based on even more fundamental thought which is our intuitions, our, our, uh, our inductions, uh, our faith even. And it's going to turn out there's at least five different kinds of induction that we use that provide these basic truths. And I'm going to prove that to you a little bit today. Not, not entirely, but a little bit. Also, we're going to use math eventually. I try to keep away from that on the blog, but there's no getting away from it here. I'll try to still... Uh, de-emphasize it as I'll explain why in this lecture. So today is just to give you a taste. Now I want to orient this towards science. I, our, our primary interest is in the kind of like a philosophy of science, although the, the techniques here of course apply anywhere. We're primarily interested in science. I'm not going to do any science for you. You're going to do it on your own in whatever fields or applications that you're interested in. I'm going to do these apparatus uh, that allow us to think about what we know, uh, about what we're uncertain of, and how to quantify, if we can, that uncertainty, which leads to probability. And then the, the, the practice of probability models is usually called statistics. So we're going to go through all that kind of a thing. Uh, and let's start simple. So uh, I'm going to start with Jane's. I'm going to start with James. We're going to start in his chapter one. And uh, next week or something like this, we'll probably move to my book. And back and forth, we'll jump around and I'll take stuff in order, uh, but uh, which I hope you can follow. James, you can find online at least some of the chapters uh, because this book was published posthumously by a student of his, of James, E.T. James. Uh, he passed these around back in the old Usenet days. We, we used to have postscript files 
of uh, of the uh, of, of individual chapters that we were passed around back in grad school and so forth, but they were never assigned as a course. And I don't know how many courses in 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 actual statistics departments. Now this damn computer keeps falling asleep on me. I've tried every setting there is to keep it awake. It won't do it. So if I have to dodge over there every uh, couple of every five minutes or so, forgive me. And I'm not going to edit me dodging out there because I'm too lazy. And I don't know how. So let's start very simple. Let's start very simple. In my book, too, you can kind of find online in places, but I'll give you what you need and, and uh, post excerpts and all that kind of thing. So let's start very simply. We have a proposition. A, I'm going to call it a proposition. This is just some sentence uh, in whichever language you prefer. Uh, you know, this A can be the proposition that this chalk is yellow. Or it could be that this chalk is black. And that's a false proposition based on the observation that it's yellow. Uh, you know, anything we like as a proposition here. Uh, that's what we're going to first assume. We're going to subjectively choose this proposition. Aha, so there's subjectivity coming involved right now. Now, what can we conclude from taking this proposition A is true? Well, we're going to use uh, this form of logical notation which means, therefore, we're going to conclude A is true. Okay. Wow, what have we done? Well, we've said that A is true, and what can we conclude? Well, that A is true. And we think, how wonderful this is, how simple. But how can you prove this? You can't prove it. You have to assume it. It's, it's one of these things that uh, is, is an axiom of logic we're going to base, uh, base it on. And axioms themselves are the, based on deeper modes of thought, these in, inductions, these uh, intellections, uh, these intuitions, the, these, these faith that we have. So this very simple thing right here has already proven us at least two things, that it's partly subjective logic because we picked this proposition, we can use rational thought to conclude that A is itself true because A is true. And the reason we know it's true is not based on any proofs other than proofs based on our intuition, which we'll come to again. Now, also, there's one more thing I forgot to say. That A is true, given we assume A is true, is objectively rigorous. It's objectively rigorous. It is in no way subjective. Once we have set this equation up, that's what this is, is an equation, we are forced to conclude that A is true. We cannot conclude subjectively that C is true, where C does not equal A. All right? So there's subjectivity in the initial parts. There's rigorous objectivity in the moves that we make, the logical moves that we make, because logic is only the science of connections of propositions. The propositions themselves are subjective, the connections are objective, and the reason we can work these simple proofs is because of our intuitions. So right there, we've done a lot. That's kind of a teaser about what we're going to see, and we're gonna be able to draw a probability from this today. So now let's move, this isn't in Jane's. I'm gonna now move to the simplest one, which is in Jane's. Here is a logical, uh, a logical equation, if you like. Well, this is where we'll start with a premise here. This is a premise. I made it up. Uh, a, a condition, an assumption. It says if the proposition A is true, then the proposition B is true. And this is a shorthand way of writing it, so I don't have to write out is true, is true. Uh, it's just a pain to keep writing out. So you, as the, the, the watcher and the listener to this, have to keep this in mind. If A is true, then B is true. Why is this important? I made it up. That's all I'm saying is I made it up. Here's the subjective part of logic right here. So I could say one other thing. Let's say A is true. What can we conclude? Well, since Aristotle, we all know, we can conclude that B is true. Because we said, if A is true, then B is true. And we assumed, subjectively, that A is true. Therefore, we can rigorously, objectively conclude that B is true. 
So we have our subjectivity and our objectivity mixed in here again. Now, you could prove this. This is something that can be proved based on those initial assumptions that come from our intuitions. Using rules of logic, we can use things called uh, truth tables. Maybe I'll uh, get into those. Dumb computer, anyway. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll show you some truth tables. And there's also this kind of line by line. You write all this stuff out in a very formal way, and you, you prove these kind of things. And that's all fine. There's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with those methods whatsoever, and they can be very useful, and in fact are. But uh, they can lead to the reification uh, of the symbols themselves. This happens all the time, especially in math. And, and James goes into this later. I go into it a little bit too. Uh, the symbols, because they're so great, uh, become realer than the underlying entities that we originally had an interest in. Our original interest was in these propositions A and B. That's it. And we wanted to know what relations they had with one another. We didn't care about the actual logic itself. We wanted to know what they said about the propositions. But if we're not careful, we could forget things. And, I, and I'm going to show you exactly how now. Uh, so there's other ways we could prove this. And I'm going to use a, a really simple graphical way here. And this, this symbol is also used formally in logic. I'm going to expropriate it uh, and show you. So we're going to say A, draw this little arrow here, which is, has a meaning in logic. But I'm going to steal it and, and, and overload it, as they say, by writing this little always underneath right there. So it's always the case that if A is true, then B is true. We're just going to assume that. So if A is true, then B is true. That's our assumption. And then A is true. Well, it's always true that B is true. So here is our simple graphical proof. It's trivial. It's nothing. There's, we haven't gained much by doing this, except for learning, again, that there's subjectivity in picking these things, objectivity in the way we formally uh, make our proofs, and the initial proofs are, are based on axiom, which we get our, from our intuitions. Okay, and we can use these alternate ways of looking at things. Okay, let's look at the second one. I'm looking for my eraser, which I stuck here. All right. We have a sophisticated operation here, only the best. I got this sidewalk uh, chalk for the grandkids, and I find it works out pretty well for this board. I hope you can see it anyway. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Well, we, we st uh, have our old friendly uh, initial premise that we assumed. If A is true, then B is true. We haven't changed that. Now we're going to assume that B is false. What can we say? Well, we're going to say that A is false. But we've done something else here. Even in the first one. I didn't show it in the first one. But we have all kind of tacit premises that are going on in here. There are tacit, implicit premises. Tacit premises, like, let me write them down here. The grammar. The definitions. You know what the word if means. You know what the word than means. You know what the word false means. You know what the word therefore means. You know what they mean in the order that they're given. So we have the definitions of the words. We have the grammar. All of that is in this equation. Although we don't write it in this equation. And we can even write it in more compact form by using, uh, you know, there's more compact symbology we could use. And all that tacit stuff gets blown away. We forget it's there. But when we write it out in full English form, which I didn't hear, I wrote a shorthand. James writes it even longer. We forget that those tacit premises are there. These are here. And these premises are just as important as the ones we wrote here. That can't be emphasized too strongly. Even though it seems trivial, this is going to play a very huge role. All right? So all that's there. And, and, and it, the reason is, which we're going to learn in just a second or emphasize again in a second, is because we've made a tacit assumption here that maybe you don't see. This is, this is a, this is, this is a well-known uh, syllogism. I'm not going to you know, bore us with it too much, but if A is true, then B is true. B is false. Therefore, A is false. Everybody will nod their head. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. But why? 
well, we could go to a truth table, but that's not getting us to the reason why. That's not getting us to the reason why. So pause the video and think about it for a moment without thinking about the formal proofs and everything, and then I'll get to it in the next example. Okay. I didn't pause. I just made it slow motion, stopped there to make it look like it paused. Very dramatic. I got only the best special effects here, including having my computer freeze up every five minutes. Piece of junk anyway. All right. Ah. I want to make sure I stick with Jane's because uh, in case you are reading the book, I don't want to jump around too much. Okay. I wrote an A over there for a purpose. Now, if A is true, then B our friendly, our friendly premise that we start with. And we're going to assume B is true. And we're going to try to conclude that A is true. And everybody will say, if we've had any familiarity with this, no, we can't say that. And it's true, you can't. This is a fallacy. But why? Well, you'll read some books and everything, and they'll give you an example. Why A is true, then if B is true, that A is true does not follow. It may be true in some way or another that A is, in fact, a true premise, but we can't conclude it using logic from these premises. We cannot draw this conclusion from these premises. But why? Well, we could use a truth table, but that's not going to give us anything. It's because we think to ourselves, and, and when we give an example, uh, or examples are given of this, we think, well, you know what? A is not the only way that B can be true. It is true that if A, then B, that's our assumption. This just means if A, then B. But it also could be that some C is true and therefore B, or some D is true, or some E is true and then B. We reason this way without writing down these tacit, these are more tacit premises right here. We don't write them down. They're there. That's how we come up with counterexamples to this particular thing to prove it's a fallacy. Perfectly fine. Except when we get lost. We forget we have some power here. We've just given ourselves a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, boost by writing it down formally like this. Uh, for one thing, we could say it can't be that A is true because it could be that C is true or D is true or E is true or one of these other uh, propositions. But we could turn this fallacy into a logical syllogism with a true conclusion by doing this. Ah. A is more plausible. So if A is true, B is true. We know that B is true. Now A is not true. Can't conclude it, but we can conclude A is more plausible. And how? What proof can we use for that? Well, we just had it right here. We know that A is one of the ways that B can be true. C is one of the ways that D can be true. D or E, whatever the set we have that we're imagining, it's there. Now, A is among them. So, therefore, if B is true, then A is more plausible. And there's also... Ah, there's also, if I can write this symbol, if you don't mind, there's a, there's a whole world of propositions out there. There's an infinite number of propositions, which I'll just label W1, W2, W3, YW, words. There's all these other propositions that, we're not, that are not in this set that we can apply B from. So A is in this set we can apply B from. And that we know B is true, therefore A is indeed more plausible. We have just proved, well, what have we proved? What's a synonym for plausible? Likely. A is more likely. More likely than what? More likely than any of these propositions here, this infinite set of propositions here. And what's a synonym for likely? Well, probability. A is more probable. In other words, we have just made a probabilistic conclusion a probabilistic syllogism right here. So probability is a matter of logic. Probability is logical. It's no different than regular logic at all. 
it's just yet uh, it's the expansion of logic until we're to conclusions where we're not certain we are uncertain about this we're certain about this conclusion we're not certain about the conclusion a by itself so there we go that's it we've just proved that probability is a matter of logic and of course it's not a complete proof i'm just teasing this right today ah before we get too far into this i want to make sure we understand that this is not causality logic is not cause although when we know cause we also have logic it doesn't go the other way around though so for instance assume that a is uh, rain this is the example james used rain and b is clouds if it's raining then it's cloudy unless the devil's beating his wife if you understand that bit of humor you can laugh feel free i can't hear you rain and clouds well obviously the clouds are part of the causal reason that it's raining uh, because you get the moisture the precipitation comes out of the clouds from uh, cloud condensation nuclei and all this kind of stuff uh, so we can get logically true if it's raining and it's cloudy that's perfectly logically true but the causality is backwards and we're going to keep this in mind because because we've just shown that logic is probability so when we come to conclusions that we're making probabilistic conclusions particularly in statistics and we're making claims of causality we can get the cause completely backwards or just completely wrong all right so we're not doing causality when we're doing logic at all all right causes causes the other way around we think of cause and then we can build logic on top of that all right ah okay so we have only a couple of more real brief ones i want to stick with james where's my eraser let's get this let's get this we're going to keep our we're going to keep our uh friendly friendly premise up here now we're going to say a is false and therefore what can we comp conclude well we can't conclude b by itself and why this is a fallacy by itself right without this 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 verbiage i set up here if a is true then b is true a is false and then we try to conclude something about b being whoops i didn't mean to say b itself i meant to say i meant to say b false i'll just put that in parentheses there to try to separate this off right there because why well in counter examples we give and everything because we know there's other ways for b to be true it could be that c is true that therefore b is true there could be one of these other propositions out there that uh that make b true is true and so b could be true or false we don't know we can't conclude from this but we can we could change it and make this conclusion logical again b is less plausible and why because in this world of propositions that say nothing about b and that doesn't mean anything to us but we've eliminated one reason one way that we know b can be true from this list of other premises or propositions rather that we have we've eliminated that therefore now b if we take b we take c d e and all these along with the world of premises it's less plausible now that b could be true we've removed one of the logical reasons that b can be true that rather not b can be true not in a causal sense that we could know b is true sometimes i slip up that's very bad i should i'm the one above all people who should know better than this not that causes b to be true that causes us to know that b is true it's a difference between what is and what we know about what is and we uh, we make that mistake uh in probability all the time and i should know better than anybody so i kick myself for that all right so consider all of that again so uh, consider all of these examples i've just given you i'm going to give you this is your homework right now okay this is your homework i'm going to write uh what am i going to do i'm going to erase this bits here just so i can write out the homework a little bit let's see here
This is also from James. Let's see here. We're changing our first premise uh, from if A is true, then B is true, to if A is true, then B is not necessarily true, but more plausible. Okay. And then we're going to also assume B is true. And whoops. No use cursing the microphone off or hitting me, I guess. All right, if A is true, then B is more plausible. That's something we're going to assume. We're also going to assume B is true. And then we're going to conclude that A is more plausible. This proposition A is more plausible. Now, I'm not going to show you how to do this. You're going to figure it out on your own. I've given you the tools to do that already uh, using the previous two examples. This forms the bulk uh, of uh, a lot of uncertain reasoning. James gives the example of a cop walking the beat and seeing a man crawling out of a jewelry store window with a bag. The cop arrests the man with the bag. Why? Well, you fill in that yourself. You fill in that yourself. That's part of your homework. Is it absolutely true that the man is a thief? No. I mean, the guy could be, it could be the owner of the thing. That he's locked himself out of the store for whatever reason. Who knows? There could be all kind of reasons uh, that the man is not a thief, but the cop arrested him anyway. So why? So we got to figure that out. If we can figure out this form of reasoning, then we're going to move into probability. That's it for today. Let me know what you think in the comments. We did very little, but teased a lot. Uh, and I, I was supposed to go 10 minutes. I think this is a bit longer. So there you have it. Thanks for watching.